And the whole idea of the foundation is to support financial content creators who have an interest in being more involved in their communities, especially when it comes to financial literacy. Welcome to the Dough Roller Money Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Berger. On today's show, we have Harlan Landis. I've known Harlan for over a decade, and he is the executive director of the Plutus Foundation. It's a foundation that provides grant money to independent finance media outlets in an effort to create programs that promote financial literacy. We're going to hear all about that. He's also the founder of popular uh, personal finance blog, Consumerism Commentary, uh, which he founded in 2003 as a way to give folks sort of a transparent look into his own finances. So I'll be interested to understand why uh, he created that blog, a blog, by the way, that for a while I actually owned. So that's a whole other story we'll talk about. Harlan, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much, Rob. It's great to talk to you. So let's start with consumerism commentary. You founded that in 2003. Can you just, you know, this was before really blogs as we know it today. You were sort of uh, one of the OGs, right? I mean, there weren't, you didn't have other personal finance bloggers to look to. So kind of tell us what was going on in your life then that sort of prompted you to start a personal finance blog? Well, it was an interesting time of my life. Uh, I, I had gotten out of a work situation that wasn't doing so well for me. Uh, I graduated college in 99, and I was working for a nonprofit. And uh, for a few years of that, uh, I realized that my financial situation was getting deeper, deeper into a hole. And it was something that I didn't see myself getting out of anytime soon. And uh, in 2001, in the period of, I think, about three months, I lost pretty much everything. I lost the job. I lost the apartment where I was living. Um, and that's a whole other story, but that's, you know, a good reason for, for you, for people to be able to communicate uh, with, with landlords and, and people and professional people. So that was a lesson I learned pretty young. Um, and I lost my girlfriend uh, and I lost my car, my only mode of transportation. So I found myself in a really difficult situation financially. Thankfully, I was able to move in with, um, you know, someone who is uh, becoming part of our family. And it was an uncomfortable situation, um, made as comfortable as could be possible, I suppose. But it, this was, you know, an, a new person's house. And uh, I just wanted to get out of there and get out of their hair and kind of move on with my life. So I found myself switching careers pretty early on. Um, and it was temporary, uh, the idea of it anyway. Uh, but the result is that I started thinking about budgeting. I started thinking about keeping uh, keeping a record of my finances. And uh, after about a year of that, I, I realized, hey, you know what? I enjoy writing online. I was a big community builder for online communities for a long time, even at that point. And I said, well, you know, I'm a blogger. Why don't I blog about this particular thing that's going on with my life as I try to track my finances and get my life into financial gear for the first time? So that was really the birth of consumerism commentary. My first post in July 2003 was, um, you know, just a, a balance sheet sort of post where I was uh, just saying, all right, here's my starting uh, position. This is, uh, this is where I am right now. Uh, after about a year of kind of uh, working in a regular job, getting a regular pay and, um, and reducing my expenses. And then I just started um, doing a lot of reading online. I was, uh, you know, as a frequent reader of the Motley Fool discussion boards, the Live Below Your Means, specifically the discussion board there. And, uh, you know, definitely got a lot of interesting ideas that made sense. Um, and I just started reading, reading a whole lot, looking online for sources, reading books, and just learning how to get a handle on my personal finances. Now, I was just yeah. sort of inject, interject here. Yeah. You mentioned the first thing you published was sort of, I guess, a balance sheet or, you know, your financial position. Yeah. Do you remember what it was? Oh, I don't remember, but I think it was just on the positive okay. side. Just, 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 you know, just barely positive net worth after kind of paying, you know, paying down the student loans, which was 
I was finally able to do after kind of getting out of the nonprofit uh, organization that I was working with. I was able to start paying down the credit cards and I was able to pay off some bills that I had, uh, like um, outstanding speeding tickets and court fees and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So, so I, I was on the way, um, you know, uh, but were, not starting. Were you blogging anonymously then? Yeah, so uh, I was blogging anonymous, anonymously because I figured that I would continue to kind of work in a typical job, typical typical career. Uh, I figured I'd be moving around jobs at some point, and uh, I knew that it was pretty easy to find information about people online. And since I was writing, since I wanted the freedom to write about my salary, benefits, and uh, financial situation. I didn't want that to be easily discovered by a potential yeah, employer. Sure. So, so yeah, I, I blogged anonymously. I wrote and published anonymously, and that continued for a while, basically until until um, I started getting some offers from newspapers and magazines to uh, to appear in some form, whether it's uh, some writing that they wanted me to do as a freelancer or it was uh, a feature that they wanted to do on me as a person. And while I think at first some of them were intrigued by the anonymity, um, some of them preferred to have uh, a legitimate byline. So I started going by my middle name at the time. So. Right. That's kind of how that progressed. You, was there a time where you sort of became more, you know, public? And how did that work in terms of friends and family who could now, oh, that, oh, oh, it's, it's Harlan over at Consumerism Commentary. Let's go back and look at all of his <laughs> his posts to see what was going on in his financial life. I mean, did that ever lead to any sort of uncomfortable situations? Uh, it led to a funny situation. It was probably the first time it was discovered. Uh, I was still anonymous at the time, and uh, I I got a message from my mother, um, and she said, is this you? Because she was reading it. She kind of recognized my tone of voice and how I write and how I talk, and uh, I don't even remember what the article was about or the post was about, but she, she immediately recognized it as me, even though I had no photos or no kind of identifying information. So, I mean, you know, a mother can do that. Um, so that was, that was when things were kind of uncovered for me. And then of course, you know, then, then next was my dad and he said, well, how come you never told me about any of this? And, you know, I never knew that you, you know, you were so, you know, involved and, you know, ha had, a, <laughs> had, a, had a good mind for finances and things like that. Yeah. And so, so it was, it, it led to some interesting conversations and this is all when I was, you know, in my twenties at some point. So, um, so it was all uh it was all it was all good and then and then after that I mean my friends weren't so interested in what I was writing about so I didn't try to like drag them into it um you know and this is at a time when the the overall theme of blogging about money was generally more about saving and budgeting than it is about like financial independence today, yeah. which is definitely a much more exciting way to look at the same topics. But uh, but it was definitely more of a you know technique and personal journey sort of thing, which uh, which I think my friends wouldn't have really connected with. So so when at some point I know. Consumers and commentary, you know, became, I guess, a business. So tell us about that. Like, how, did, did you transition to working on it full time and, and did it become more of a business? And how did that work for you? Yeah, there's a long process there, because when I started, um, sure, there were some blogs that made money. Um, some of them were in the political uh, arena and uh, there were some ad opportunities and things like that. And people, people were able to make some money, but it wasn't huge. It wasn't, it wasn't something that someone would say, oh, well, you know, I need to make, I need, I need to think about how I'm going to make some extra income. Why don't I start a blog? So for me, it was merely a way to track my progress, to share, to meet some new people, to talk about money. And uh, the financial end of it was very much an afterthought. Um, about a year into 
operating the blog maybe a year and a half i decided i decided to start running some ads and see how that went and it was it was slow um and i never expected it would make anything more than you know the cost to pay back the the price of owning a domain name which i didn't even own at first um i just kind of you know threw it on the domain name of something else that i owned um but uh, after a while i i you know things things started to pick up and it was during the recession i think of 2008 or so that uh, that people really started paying attention to uh, consumerism commentary and some of the other blogs that were around at the time. And we started getting a lot of these uh, attention from the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. I have a, I have a framed um, printing plate from the Wall Street Journal because uh, I had a friend who worked there. Actually, he, he ended up helping me on the, Plutus, uh, on the uh, consumerism commentary podcast. Uh, but um, there was, there was a, a feature... Uh, article in one of the, um, I don't know, it was probably the Sunday Journal or something like that. And uh, it mentioned a few personal finance blogs as kind of a new thing. And uh, and so he was able to grab me the printing plate of that article. And so I've got that framed and and uh, it's on nice. my wall. But, but yeah, we were getting some attention here and suddenly people were looking for this information and they were looking in places other than CNN and Money Magazine and uh, MSN Money. And we were, th there was some attention. And then of course, with the eyeballs, there were companies that started getting interested in advertising on, on sites like mine. So it became a way for me to make some extra money and uh and i let that happen and i encouraged it over time and uh i i never considered it as something i would be living off of until until things started getting you know really deep into uh into the possibilities for income and uh over time the amount of revenue I was able to generate just from advertising um, was approaching uh, the what I was earning from my day job in this in this job that I took after I left that nonprofit, still at the same company uh, a few years later, and suddenly, um, just from advertising alone, I'm able to uh, kind of match what I'm making. So I thought, okay, if I'm able to surpass what I'm making in my day job with uh, advertising for, for, for consumerism commentary, I'll consider quitting my day job and working on this full time and really growing it. And so that, that day came and went. And, uh, you know, as it passed, I said, well, you know, I still feel a little uncomfortable about this. This seems crazy that you can make a full time, uh, salary from just, uh, writing on the internet. And uh, I said, okay, when it makes twice as much as what I'm making uh, from my day you job, keep moving that's the, the, end the day. Zone further and further away. I, yeah, like I just I would get to that point, and it's like this can't be real. I don't believe any of it. It's going to disappear at any time. And uh, and then that continued. I think I think when it was uh, when it was making three times what I was earning annually in my salary, my day job salary. I said, okay, you know, it's time for that for that day job exit plan to, to happen now. And so I did, I quit, I quit that job. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, that allowed me to work on the website full time. I was already spending eight hours a day. Um, you know, I would work and then I'd eat dinner and then I would probably work another eight hours, just writing articles, communicating with people. Yeah. Uh, so it, it was, uh, you know, it was a, it was a time where I had some flexibility in order to yeah, do yeah. that. Life is a lot more busy. So now. <laughs> if, we, if we fast forward, you eventually sell the site. What remind me what year that was? Yeah, so I, I think it was 2011. Uh, so um, it's 2011 or 2012. Either way, I had I. I, I had around the same time that I quit the, the day job to work on it full time, I had gotten you know, a strange email. It, it was just out of the blue. It was, uh, it was an offer, uh, to purchase consumerism commentary. And, um, you know, I thought, well, this is interesting. I hadn't even considered, you know, the idea that this has value beyond what it's, you know, what, what's happening right now. And, you know, the, uh, just the, the idea that it's somehow bringing in some money. Like I, I didn't have a business mind towards what I was doing at all. 
But that email kind of changed the approach. And I'm like, all right, maybe, you know, this, this offer is interesting, but I think that there's a lot of growth yet still to come. So what if I spend the next year really focusing on building the, the website, working on some of the things that, you know, I, I needed to do in order to maximize its value and then see where it goes from there. Uh, so, so that's kind of what I did. I went into some talks with the company, but it didn't really amount to anything. And, uh, at the same time, I just started really focusing on some of the things that I didn't really like to do, like SEO and managing affiliate relationships. I brought on some help, uh, and, uh, and, you know, together we kind of figured out what was going to, you know, really really maximize the potential value for, for someone. And one of the reasons that I wanted, you know, I was really considering this rather than just saying, you know what, I'm going to build this for 20 years and then go from there. One of the reasons that I wanted to kind of uh, explore the opportunity to, to get rid of this is to, to, to at least move on and uh, maximize its value at that time was that I still believe that it was very, um, very volatile. Like this was also around the same time that Google was making a lot of changes to its search algorithm and the results that you see when you search for things. One of the things that drove up the value of the website was the fact that it was listed as a top search result, if not the first result for some, for some credit card related uh, search terms. I remember that. Things that people look for. Yeah, pe people were looking for cashback credit cards. Um, and they still they would, are, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I have a feeling. Yeah. Yeah. So but but what would happen is that because I had published some of my experiences and my thoughts on earning cash back and uh, and had talked about certain credit cards, um, the the website was ranking at the very top for a lot of these search terms. So a lot of people who are looking for this would before they even would before they would even go to Chase or Citibank or American Express, they'd stop off at consumerism commentary to see what, you know, so to see what the review is and to see what we thought of these cashback cards. And, um, and so those, as a result, those companies were interested in advertising and uh, that was in addition to affiliate relationships that we set up. So that means that, you know, I'm sure your listeners are familiar with this, but, you know, basically consumerism commentary would get paid anytime someone visited and signed up for a credit card as a result right. of landing on consumerism commentary first. Now, what I tried to do is to deal with the ethics of it all is try to be as impartial as I could and as fair and write actual reviews for the cards pointing out, um, you know, their flaws as much as their benefits. Uh, I'm not sure if that's, you know, if affiliate, um, you know, marketing today really allows you that kind of freedom. But at the time, I was able to share my thoughts and, and, um, and really be honest with, with what I was writing about. And I think that helped in, in the initial, you know, setup as consumerism commentary being one of the top sites for this type, type of information. So, uh, so yeah, we spent the next year just maximizing um, all of that, working with the card companies directly to to kind of figure out what type of opportunities we can put together for them, and uh, and in the end, in the end, uh, we the, the the site was able to get a few different um, offers from a few different potential buyers, and so there was a little bit of a bidding war that happened, small one, and it really drove up. The, the 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 price that we were able to to sell the site for and um and it was you know it, it was a good multiple of what that initial offer was so i think it was a year well spent good good so i don't know yeah. that fire financial independence retire early was a term being thrown around in 2011 but you know after you sold in did you fire so to speak were you now financially independent or you know like i guess in combination with that question because it's been what a decade any regrets hmm. from selling? Yeah, uh, no regrets from selling. I think it was the right thing to do at the time. And I still think it, you know, looking back, it was definitely the right thing for me. Uh, the, the volatility, um, you know, I, I saw this site, 
you know, just kind of drop off the radar uh, not long after I sold it to the company. And, you know, part of that is probably due to the the amount of effort they kept, they put into the upkeep of and the, the work that you have to do to keep it going. But I think part of it also was the changes in algorithms and, and things like that. And certainly a lot of those search results today are now commanded by big brands that put a lot of effort into marketing, um, which is probably something that if I wanted to compete with over the last decade, um, I, I definitely would have had to structure uh, the business a lot differently. And I was not exactly prepared to to really go down that path. So I'm, I'm happy. Uh, I'm satisfied. And I think it was a good decision. Um, and in terms of, you know, firing and, you know, financial independence, I, uh, for a long time, I was in the mindset that everything I was earning from the site was just extra. And, you know, I wouldn't touch it as much as possible. And that kind of changed when, when I quit the day job. And, uh, uh, but to be honest, I still haven't, I still hadn't for a long time. It's 10 years later, nearly. And I haven't touched a lot of that money. I've just allowed it to grow. Um, uh, but these days I am living off of, uh, off of not just the money from the sale from the website, but what it was earning prior to that as yeah, well. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and uh, I should be, you know, I should be good to, uh, to, to continue to do that and without having to work. So, I suppose that in a way I have fired. Um, I haven't really, so until recently, I hadn't really changed too much about my living situation. Um, I did uh, eventually get uh, a more expensive apartment, a uh, longtime renter. I did not buy a house until just uh, a couple of months ago. So this is the yeah, thank you. This is the first house I've owned, and it's certainly one that I wouldn't have been able to afford if I, you know, didn't um, kind of find a way to grow my finances the way I did with with consumerism commentary. So, uh, so I'm I'm feeling great about it. Um, I am. Sh I've also allowed myself to to spend my time doing things that. I enjoy and I get a lot out of, including the Plutus Foundation, but also going back to my nonprofit roots and working with arts organizations and music groups and, uh, and having sort of a very busy and stressful life doing that. I, I guess some people fire and they live the stress-free free life. Maybe they travel, maybe they just, uh, you know, uh, you know, downsize to a cabin somewhere and enjoy their time with their family. Um, kind of in a different position where I I entered all of this uh, myself. Uh, no spouse, no significant other, uh, no long, you know, no serious significant other until now. And and now I'm, you know, we're looking at ways of, of kind of moving forward in our relationship. And it's it's a whole different uh, whole different setup for me now. Uh, How yeah. do you? Um so how did you invest the money? Uh, you know, is it low cost index funds? Is it simple, you know, three fund portfolio? How do you invest the money you earn from the website? Yeah, so what I did uh, right away was um, I went right to Vanguard and I invested in just a couple of funds. There was uh, the the uh, total stock market index fund, the international uh, stock market index fund, and two bond funds, and both were sort of, uh, you know, kind of a tax, um, tax, um, tax advantaged bond funds. Um, one was, I think, a New Jersey bond fund where I was living at the time, um, now in Pennsylvania, and the other was, um, you know, just a, just a tax advantaged municipal bond fund. So basically, it was down to four funds. Um, since then, it's become a little more, little more complicated. I, I'm working with, uh, with um, a couple of different uh, financial advisors now who, who are, you know, taking, taking an approach at, you know, taking a piece of what, what we have and, and kind of, uh, you know, giving some advice on that and getting away from the funds a little bit and more into just kind of replicating the funds from a more, uh, you know, stock-based approach and ETF, which will be a little more advantageous from a tax situation. So that's so interesting. That's, so you were a low-cost yeah. Vanguard 
Boglehead die hard, investing on your own, and then somewhere along the line you decided to hire some investment advisors who are, are charging you some percentage of assets under management, I'm guessing? Yeah, and, and it's a low fee. And, um, you know, one of, one of the things that was, you know, this, this probably wasn't a good move at the time, but I had, I had a friend who, um, you know, regular deal, regularly dealt, uh, dealt with wealth. And, you know, he, he suggested that, you know, in, in my position, if there were opportunities that I'd want to take advantage of, I'd want to have a, uh, a, a, an open credit line available to me. So I said, okay, well, that's interesting. Um, and in order to do that, what he suggested was just get set up in a, in a regular um, investment bank, you know, as a, uh, like the, the Wells Fargo advisors, which is what it's, it's where I went. And, um, and they, uh, and they, so, so what they would do is I would be able to have my assets held under Wells Fargo. I could I could resist all of their marketing as much as I wanted and just stay invested in what I was invested in um, and also have this credit line available through the bank. And I said, okay, well, you know, that sounds interesting. I'll do that. And I'm not sure that it was ever really necessary because I never used it, uh, but I did shut it down as I was qualifying for a mortgage to buy this house. And I guess one question is, you know, why buy a house with the mortgage, even though I could pay cash for it? Um, and, you know, the answer to that is, well, I just wanted to keep money invested as much as possible because I knew the rates for the mortgage were so sure. low, and it would probably be advantageous and there to, be taxes to just and leave as much. And some investments yeah. And, yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, you said rates are so low. I, I, I gather the, 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 was that something, in terms of the um, line of credit, was that like a, a, a pile of pledged asset line kind of thing? Or yeah, it was. Yeah, it was pledged as collateral. And it was a collateral. So what I ended up doing at Wells Fargo was collateralizing the account, um, and I had to reverse all of that when I went through the process uh, to get the mortgage, because as I don't have regular income now, that was you know it, there were some obstacles to to get through, and and in the end we got through it, but they had to do an asset dissipation calculation. Um, I had assets outside of Wells Fargo, the mortgage is well with Wells Fargo as well, and uh, I know that's you know today these days and probably the whole time that hasn't been the best bank, uh, you know, in terms of their policies and privacy and and arbitration and things like that. Uh, and uh, but nevertheless, it's the bank that I've been with yeah, yeah. since I was 13 and, and years improved. old. <laughs> I mean, they've got all new management, yeah. and all, and, but, but yeah, they have yeah, had a, yeah. a, not, not the best of history, but, but how did all that go from that to now, rather than investing on your own, you're paying someone to do the investing for you? Yeah, well, it's, it's only a piece of, of what I have. Um, and, uh, I, you know, this was my, my primary, um, you know, financial advisor is someone that I met through the community of financial bloggers. Uh, he was a financial uh, planner who um, who also had a uh, website, and he ended up selling his planning business and his advising business. Um, so, so now I have new money managers, but uh, but it's all as a result of the connections that I had made. And and uh, you know, honestly, I just uh, you know, I I, I felt like what he was saying made sense. And it's just a matter of optimizing what I'm already doing with this very similar strategy. Just, you know, they're able to focus on a little more of the detailed things and, you know, able to react to, um, you know, long-term trends that might be happening. And, uh, you know, they're able to focus beyond the, the, the mid, the middle term priorities as well. Yeah, so okay. it's, uh, it's, 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 for me, I, I, I find the value um, for, for someone with probably less, uh, you know, concerns about tax optimization and, uh, you know, for someone who's just dealing with retirement funds or something like that, I would, I would still say that index fund investing is, is the way to go uh, for, for, you know, for most people. Do you, um, before we leave the fire topic... Do you, you yeah. know, there's a lot of, a lot of ink has been spilled over a safe withdrawal rate and how much you can spend each year without running out of money. How, you know, you're young, certainly for someone that's retired. Yeah. Um, how do you think <laughs> about and calculate how much you can spend each year without, you know, going broke? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm not a big spender. I'm not I'm not going out and making a big deal out of spending the money that I have and, you know, maybe I should, you know, allow myself to do a little bit more. But uh instead of looking at the percentage, I really just look at the expenses that I'm dealing with and for for a while, uh I knew that I was able to um withdraw about 2 to 3% of my assets without um you know, w- with, without feeling the strain of anything. So, so that for me, that was, that was I, knowing that that was kind of below the 4% recommended, um, you know, initial withdrawal. I, I felt pretty good about that, at, you know, expe- especially knowing that, you know, there's a potential that I have m- much more than 30 years to go, uh, hopefully a lot more than 30, but, you know, uh, you know, we can't predict. So I, I, I felt really comfortable with that two to 3% uh, withdrawal that I started off with. But now my life is getting a little more complicated. I am, you know, in a relationship now where we're starting to look at things differently and think about the future and things like that. So, uh, so, you know, there, there, there's a little bit of a change there and my lifestyle is creeping up a bit and I'm totally comfortable with that. Uh, I think, I think, you know, based on my asset level today and uh, where, you know, the, you know, my age, I think, I think I'll absolutely be fine. Okay, good. Yeah. So, so there's no pressure. I don't feel any pressure to, to work. Um, There are some projects I would like to take on. There are some things that I think would be, um, you know, profitable. Um, And uh, it's, uh, I just don't feel, you know, you know, for better or worse, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't feel the pressure to have to come up with something uh, in the next month yeah. or two. That's a good place to be. Well, speaking of projects, let's talk about the Plutus Foundation. Can you tell us about the foundation, sure. what it does, why you started it, and, and what you're doing today with it? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, going back to consumerism commentary, uh, what I found back 15 years ago is that a lot of people are looking for information online about money. And we there 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 started to a community started to build around this idea of sharing financial information online whether it's from a personal perspective or whether it is outright advice but something that is different than the 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 the, the larger publications that had their money columns every week um so uh, I, I really enjoyed being a part of this community and I liked being involved and I liked lifting voices up. So one of the things that um, I created was the Plutus Awards. And that was just a way for the community to recognize uh, some of the best work that was being done in publishing about money, uh, mostly blogging at the time. Podcasts didn't really come up till a little bit later. And then certainly a lot of people are doing video publishing now, which is fantastic. And, uh, and this was also a way to bring more attention to the community as well. So it really served two purposes. And uh, the Plutus Awards just grew over time. And as I've never won, you know, by as the I was I'm getting very upset about that, although uh, I do think this podcast was nominated yeah. once. So I've got that going for me. Didn't mean to cut you off. Well, that's, that's great. Yeah. No, that's okay. You know, there, there, it's, there's, there's so many, um, you know, so so many people out there publishing, and I think, you know, it's it's great to just have, you know, to, just just to be a finalist. I think is fantastic. So, uh, but anyway, this the, the the awards grew over time, and as I was kind of getting away from consumerism commentary, um, I wanted to find more ways to give back to the community. So that's I kind of took what we were doing with the Plutus Awards and built sort of an idea of a foundation around that. And the whole idea of the foundation is to support financial content creators who have an interest in being more involved in their communities, especially when it comes to financial literacy and uh, different projects that they could possibly put together in a way that might be a little more effective or creative than some of the typical financial literacy projects we see out there. Uh, So we wanted to, um, you know, uh, uh, a benefit 
and encourage people to be more creative with the programs that they do in their own communities. So we give grants out. We give grants, uh, financial resources, and and other types of resources like uh, social media support and uh, advice uh, to members of the community who propose um, you know a project that they've been working on that they just need a little extra help with or something brand new that they could only do with the help with uh, you know from someone like the Plutus Foundation. Uh, so it's gone from that to us hosting events as well, um, like Plutus Voices, which is um, an event that is designed to help financial content creators make more of an impact on their audiences and uh, just have an effect on the lives of people who who read and watch and listen. So uh, so and we're we're continuing to develop more things that benefit this community as we go along and as people come to us with more fantastic ideas. So uh and, and is the foundation uh funded through just charitable contributions? It's funded through charitable contributions and sponsorships that we have with with a few companies that have uh you know really appreciated our approach and thankfully there are also companies that you know basically uh don't you know they they don't want to interfere with the message, so they let us do what we feel is best. Uh, as uh, you know, they see the foundation as experts in the community and want to you know rely on us to to get the message out in the way that is going to be most effective to members of the community. So, if, if someone wanted to either support the foundation or perhaps apply for a grant, where would they go? So they would go to PlutusFoundation.org, and that is where we have all of the information about grants and the various programs and projects that we support and run ourselves, and as well as some of the events that they can sign up to attend. Um, and all of that is from our hub at PlutusFoundation.org. Okay, great. So in addition to the foundation, do you have any projects that you're either working on now or, or, or plan to start uh, in the not-too-distant future that you want to share with us? Um, yeah, I, so one of the things that I spend my time on now, um, you know, especially since uh, I have the flexibility to do that is, uh, you know, I work with a, a music group, a youth music group. So uh, we, uh, I'm we spend uh, a lot of time uh, through, we're in auditions season right now. So a lot of uh, teenagers between the ages of 14 and 21 are, you know, are, are auditioning. And we go through this process where they rehearse through the winter and the spring. And in the summer, uh, we take them on tour mm -hmm. around the country, competing in different events. And it's an amazing experience. And it's been a part of my life in some form um, for, uh, for a long time since high High school and you know I'm, I'm happy that I have the opportunity to give back to that um, in some form and that form has taken uh, time uh, that uh, that that is quite uh, quite an undertaking um, but uh, aside from that um, we're we're looking to build a few new programs into the Plutus Foundation and including uh, um, you know, the Impact Summit, which is something that we did virtually last summer. It was a great event for financial content creators to uh, get to know each other, networking, um, to learn about techniques that are going to help them with their projects, whether it's uh, a blog or a podcast or a video series. And, uh, you know, just a great way for all of us to get together. And uh, in the future, we intend on turning that into an in-person event as well. Right. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on with the Plutus Foundation. Terrific. Well, if folks want to follow your work, where, where can they best do that? Well, uh, you know, these days, if someone wants to get in touch with me, probably uh, social media is the best way. Um, I'm on Twitter at Harlan Landis. Um, I don't really interact much on social media these days personally, but certainly everything that I do is going to be put through the Plutus Foundation. And you can find me at Plutus Awards uh, and the entire team. It's not just me at Plutus Awards on um, Twitter and Instagram, as well as, you know, the many ways to contact us through Facebook, including the Plutus Foundation community, which is a great place for financial content creators to network with each other and uh, get the get the first look at various projects that we're doing and also uh, find ways to uh, collaborate with each other. Well, that's terrific. Well, Harlan, Harlan thanks so much for uh, uh, joining us today. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, I appreciate it, Rob. And if, uh, you know, happy to talk to you anytime if there's anything you need.